Hello and welcome to At One With Animals Conversations to Inspire. I'm Janine Upame and my guest today is Karen Jane Dudley, fondly referred to as KJ, who is a wildlife photographer. KJ's passion for photography was encouraged at a young age by her grandfather, a former BBC cameraman, leading to her becoming an award-winning professional wildlife photographer. She has a passion for the natural world and a deep love for Africa, which can clearly be seen in her work, which has been published all over the world, including exhibits at Dimbola Lodge on the Isle of Wight and the Greg Fleshman Studio in Los Angeles. For KJ, one particular endangered cat has long been a source of mystery and intrigue, the white lions. In 2008, the Global White Lion Protection Trust awarded KJ the prestigious White Lion Roar Award, recognition of animal rights, for her ethical and sensitive approach to the photographing of large predators both in captivity and in their natural environment. KJ had the privilege of capturing the first official signature portraits of the project's first generation of wild-born white lion cubs born in 2008 on the soil of their ancestors within their natural endemic range of the white lion heartlands. KJ hosts a number of annual ethical wildlife photography safaris across the African continent in support of vital conservation efforts. Hi, KJ. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you, Janine. Thank you very, very much for the invite. Um, an amazing opportunity to hopefully uh, awaken something in most people uh, that I think we're all very much capable of. Mm. And our connection with the natural world, which I think is becoming more and more poignant um, as time has gone on, particularly over the past... 18 months mm, yeah absolutely and I'm sure your your work and and the way you talk about your experiences with wildlife will definitely inspire many many people I very much hope so it's I'm never happier than being absolutely in the middle of nowhere <laughs> basically with a bag of camera equipment um, <laughs> just that that raw connection of mm switching everything off everything that we know and putting down the cell phone and actually switching it off and actually talking to people in the right way and, and connecting with nature I don't need a cell phone and yeah okay I do have some forms of modern technology with me um, but it's not always needed mm. just put me in the middle of nowhere surrounded by nature and I yeah that's it that's what I need yeah I think being able to switch off it's okay to use it, but knowing when to switch off and having time away, absolutely. Exactly. It's almost like, a, I mean, I find my job, um, I've always said with anybody, I think if you can say that you're in a, a career that you love, mm. it reflects in your work. Um, and to me, it's almost, regardless of being my, my career, it's almost like a form of therapy um, because I can come back to my, my, my home and, I've got busy things buzzing around me and everybody's back and jostling around. And I've got a studio or an office I'm sitting in and things coming in at all angles. And you think, wow, I need that therapy again. And it's almost <laughs> as quickly as you get back, you want to get back out there. So yeah, it, it can have such a huge influence on us. I think not only physically, but mentally as well. 
Oh, I'm sure. Connecting with nature and, and just mm. literally getting away from the buzz and hype of, of what mm. surrounds us. Mm. So tell us about, how did this all start? Tell us about the, the early years with your grandfather. What was that like? Mm, okay, a very uh, a wonderful man that I had so much respect for. Um, my grandfather worked uh, for the BBC and it's quite a, a poignant year for me actually because he was actually part of the, the BBC broadcast unit that actually filmed Queen Elizabeth II's um, coronation. Mm -hmm. So with this year being her platinum jubilee, I think it's really brought home to me that despite him not being with us physically anymore I know that he's watching and I know that he would want he would really want me to do what I'm doing now and it was taking his lead um, and it's something that was important to me I'd always been somebody who's very arty I, I had to be creating something um, and picking up a camera it just just opened up a whole new world um, and it's something I would encourage anyone to do but this all comes down to his influence um, as I say very proud of what he achieved uh, and it's just carrying that mantle on for him and taking it to another level um, there are times when I would dearly nowadays love to have him back even if it was just for the, for the day to let him see the technology, how it's advanced and what he would make of today's modern technology. Would he embrace it or would he say, we need to step back? So it's a question that I think will forever live with me, but I would dearly love to know what he would make of, of how we've advanced um, and how beneficial how advancement can be, uh, particularly for nature as well, as it can play an important role. Yeah, I'm sure. We, we are upgrading and with upgrading, uh, it's progress is seen as something negative, but actually it can really support and, and help nature, animals. Yeah. Yeah, it can. I mean, we, there's, there is a very fine line to walk between conservation and commercialism. It's a very fine line to walk. And through my ethical work, and people say to me, well, what is ethical? How do, how do you draw that line at what is ethical? And today's modern technology, you, they were two things you would, years ago would never have put into the same sentence, ethical and uh, advanced technology, but it actually opens up a whole new world for many people who, let's face it, not everyone is lucky to have the job I have, not everybody is lucky to travel the way that I do. And to see some of the beautiful places throughout the world that I've been to. But if my imagery can, I don't know, just awaken something within people, mm. then modern technology is a great benefit. Mm. And particularly with well, the way I view my work of animals being able to communicate through me, mm. um, not actually through me physically, but through my lens then joining those two together, the technology really does come into its own and it does enable wildlife to use the technology as well in a positive way. Um, there are many, with, with anything in life, there are negatives and positives. And if we embrace the positive, rather than walking down the continual negative route, we, we can really do some, some amazing things and achieve amazing things. Mm. And I think with the way our planet is at the moment, we know how fragile it is. Um, we've actually found our own fragile state over the past 18 months when something microscopic has taken a species that looks to be dominant to its knees. <laughs> um, it, it just proves how fragile our own existence is. And regardless of thinking we are the dominant ones, we're not, we're just as fragile. Mm. So by using, say, technology to, to advance things and to open up a world to people that many are becoming awakened to now, it can only be a good thing. It can mm. only be a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree that um, 
that technology does, as long as it's used for the highest good, it actually can enhance and heal, of course. There's a lot of technology being used now to heal the planet. Yeah, the, the one so, thing yeah. I've always been very conscious of um, through my work as a wildlife photographer is when do we become intrusive? And as much as our modern technology is good, there are boundaries mm -hmm. and we need to respect those boundaries. Um, whenever you take a walk in something like an ancient woodland, be careful where your feet go because every footprint we place, mm. we're breaking down an ecosystem. So we have to be very careful mm. of our own imprint. So as good as photography or modern technology can be, it can also become intrusive. It can also have a negative impact. So we need to embrace the positive side. Mm. And we also need to be aware of our own impact uh, and we need to be very aware of, of just what we're doing um, so I would never ever say to anybody pick up a camera and go marching out into the middle of a stag herd during the rut because it would just be a disrespectful to those animals disrespectful to nature but also downright dangerous so we have a very fine line to walk when we try to push over these uh, or portray, I should say, rather than push over to portray the ethical side. A lot of it comes down to our own conscience. Um, so we need to be very, very careful of, of just how we do apply that. Mm. It's for someone thinking about um, going out into nature and perhaps going to an ancient woodlands, as you say, what's the what advice can you give them on how to be most respectful to nature? Okay, well, there are many, many ways that we can look at our own, um, our, our own, the way that we do things, particularly as I mentioned before, something like the rut. Now it's it's something that I absolutely adore photographing and each year once the rut starts you have these huge stags who are suddenly pumped full of testosterone and let's face it it's not something you would want to get in the way of uh, you really wouldn't these animals are absolutely magnificent but I have witnessed in the past people now we have the, the capability of taking images on our mobile phones, seeing them pushing the limit, trying to get in too close. Now, the minute you get too close, you start to affect their behavior. Now, that problem then stems from once you start to affect their own behavior, you can cause a distraction and you are causing distress. Now, those stags are pumped full of testosterone with these huge antlers that can become absolutely lethal. And what people don't understand is by enforcing yourself upon them, you are going to change the balance. So straight away, they're going to drop their guard. They're going to be wary of you being to wherever you are, their right or their left. They drop that guard for two seconds, their opponent is going to take that opportunity. So straight away, you've created a major problem. So I would always say step back. Don't always pick the camera up, but be aware of how your own presence is going to affect what is going on. Let them gently get into what they need to do. These stags are are literally challenging each other for territory. They don't need another sector in there, should we say, it's going to affect that. So be conscious of where you are, be conscious of how you're impacting upon their natural behavior. Mm. These stags are gonna be absolutely exhausted by the time they're finished. And if he's that exhausted and you are pushing further and further and further, the whole situation become, can become extremely volatile and unpredictable. So our actions will affect what will happen to his behavior and his direction that could bring him into a situation that's been unnaturally enforced.
So always be aware of your own actions um, and, and really be respectful. Yeah, no, it's really well said. So where did your love of the natural world come from? Oh, my goodness. Um, I think from a very early age, I'd always had a fascination with nature. Absolute fascination. Apart from, I'm going to admit this now, on camera, I have one, I wouldn't say fear, but one phobia, <laughs> and that is frogs. I have no idea why, because they're so tiny and so precious, mm. and let's face it, are an important part of the natural world, but I have no idea. So as a child, I'd be playing with looking at observing butterflies and caterpillars. If you brought a frog near me, I'd be six miles away within five <laughs> minutes. But I still had the utmost respect for them. Mm. But I remember very clearly um, at a very young age um, having a dream, and that was actually quite vivid, of walking with this huge lion by my side, a very pale lion. He wasn't a lion I recognised, as we all recognised the tawny lion with the big golden mane and the golden body. Um, but very, very pale. Um, and he was walking by my side and it was a dream that I think has, it stayed with me um, and something I never forgot. And it actually drove me down the route of wanting to work with wildlife. Mm. And my background before I really pushed on with my photography career, um, and I think it actually enhanced my photography was uh, working with animals in a care situation. I don't like the word captive um, because I think it's, uh, it's not the correct word. Um, a cared facility, I think, is, is a better way um, mm. of describing it. And there are, as we know, thousands across the world. Um, but having that ability to work with some amazing animals that have been through such an awful life, giving them an opportunity to understand what it was to be loved and cared for, it was an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. And it drove me down that route of wanting to do more for nature, as well as caring for it, getting out there and actually opening up the world and letting people see the trials and the and the, the everything that goes with nature mm. and let's face it it, it is a, a really tough and as we know fragile existence so it gave me that capacity to want to take um those two and combine them so i had the nature background and the photography mm. and i thought wow what an extremely powerful combination and i think working with them in a care situation and producing those images and feeling what I was getting coming back through the lens, it was a case of they're giving me a message, you have a job to do. And through those messages, I knew where I, what I had to do. Mm. Um, and it was the opportunity to give them their voice, um, embracing, as we said earlier, the modern technology, mm. the animal being able to use that to actually put its message across, which really is quite an important message as well mm. to get across. And how did you do that? Or how do you do that? It's a case of when I'm um, out, wherever I'm working, uh, be it Africa, be it wherever I'm working, it's a case of when you are sitting with these animals, I don't mean literally sitting with them, I mean respectfully distanced from them. Today, we have the power of zoom lenses. Mm. You know, we can pick up a pimple on something miles <laughs> away. It's very easy to do now. And with the equipment that we have, the clarity is amazing. So sitting, observing, and giving them that opportunity to speak through the camera. And quite often, as we are now, we're conversing. Mm -hmm. Animals have a slight advantage over us, obviously, the way I feel anyway. We're able to verbally communicate. Animals have an additional level. Not only can they understand verbal communication, 
because they're audible, they can make their own sounds, but they understand body language. Mm. And it's something we very rarely use. And I think we've lost that ability over the millennia to, to read and understand body language. So when I'm sitting close to a pride of lions, wild lions, and I will sit there and use that positive energy, my own body language will help them to relax. If I'm fidgeting about in a vehicle, jumping about, quickly grabbing my camera and quickly holding it there, that creates an air of heightened excitement. Mm. And that is, gonna, that is gonna expand. It's going to come across to them. So if you have a flight animal, something like an impala that's going to suddenly think, oh, that's a little bit too much for me. Mm. They're going to disappear. They're going to move away from you. Don't pursue them. If that animal chooses to distance itself, that's fine, let it go. It's not comfortable. But if you're quiet and relaxed and you communicate with that animal through that body language, they're going to relax. You're going to see natural behavior being shown, which is what we're trying to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. It's then giving that animal the ability to trust you. That trust can be gained they can then portray the message they wish to give out mm. through that lens. And if that image can connect with somebody, it's amazing how powerful silence can be. So a silent image can be so powerful. Mm. It, it, the power of silence is absolutely amazing. But if your viewer can connect with that image, then that animal has brought that message across. Mm. And it, it is very... It's not difficult to achieve, but we need to have an openness and we need to understand we can't be dominant. We need to be on the same level. And that is respect. Mm -hmm. Respect has, it's such a huge word. It really is. So with wildlife photography, there are rules, um, things that we need to remember. Um, and if we can remember all those the, the principles, I would say, I, I wouldn't say they're rules, but they're principles. If we can get those principles correct and we can apply them in a good way, then we can really seriously help nature. Mm. We have a lot of ways that we can do things. And it comes down to three little words, respect, trust, and understanding. Mm. Beautiful. So you're going to show us some of the amazing breathtaking photos that you've taken. Um, and so what advice could you give people who are gonna look at the photographs so that they can take in the full message of the animals that you're gonna show us? Okay, I think the most important um, factor that I, I always look at with my job, my first thing is I really have a dislike of the word take people ask me what do you do for a living I'm a photographer oh you take photographs I really have a, a bit of a problem with the word take I do not take photographs I simply preserve a vision it's a much better way of saying it so I try not to take anything from nature Part of my revenue is generated back into conservation, but I would always say to people, when you view those images, switch off and connect. Most of my work, I'm, I'm known for my close-up work. So a lot of my uh, imagery is portrait style with wildlife. And the most important factor that I look for is eye contact. Now, eye contact with that animal means that level of trust is suddenly, it's at its correct level. It's, mm. it's there. You have gained their trust. But the power that comes through to me, myself, when I have an animal staring back down the barrel of my lens, mm. it's immense, mm. absolutely immense. And the connection is amazing but you can still connect with them through that image you don't have to be looking down the barrel of the lens so my objectives whenever i set out to produce images is to try and wait for that eye contact i wait for that level of respect 
And then I ask them to produce that message. Now, we know that in our world that we have copyright laws, we have laws of protection, uh, where you wouldn't, I would never go out and photograph somebody without saying to them, do you mind if I use this? But who has that for nature? Mm. Who sets those rules? And you have to be disciplined. And my level of respect is I will sit back and I will let them take control. Mm -hmm. I will be there ready with the camera when you are ready to have the image produced. Let me know. And once I can do that, I have their trust. They have my trust. They look straight down that barrel and that message will come through. Mm. And if you give them time, sit and look at that image and just try to depict the message they're trying to give you. And it is one of respect. Mm. It's one of unity and one of harmony. Um, and it's a beautiful way to be. It's a much better way to be. Um, but as I say, your, your entire body language will determine exactly how that will outcome. Mm. Beautiful. Okay, so who are you going to show us? Okay, well, I've, I've picked up a few images um, that I would like to share uh, with everybody. Um, one of them is an image that I actually produced last year. I had a very... Um, Obviously, like everybody, uh, the last 18 months have been incredibly difficult for traveling. So I've stayed where I was. And I took a first ever trip to a beautiful area in Wales where I'd never been before. Mm. And I had an encounter with a group of Wild Welsh Mountain ponies. And mm. ponies and horses have a, a big place in my heart anyway. Mm. And there was one particular little filly um, that I, oh my goodness, I saw her for the first time and absolutely fell in love with her. And I came home and she had such a profound effect on me that I thought my chances of ever seeing her again will be very slim. The Brecon Beacons is huge. <laughs> but I was determined to meet up with her again. And I went back again uh, eight months later Oh my goodness, and lo and behold, I actually did find her mm. and um, sat myself down uh, quite a distance from her and thought, I'm just going to observe. I just want to see what she does. I'm just able to be here and to observe her. And incredibly, she lifted her head and looked in my general direction. I must have been a good oh my goodness, a good thousand meters from her. I was having to watch her through binoculars. And she slowly started to make her way across to the point where she was at one point no more than 200 meters away from me. And I just sat very still. I thought, I'm not even going to pick the camera up. I don't want to break this moment because mm. it's that connection between me and her. And she put her head down, she walked even closer. She stood about, I would say no more than what, 10 meters from me. Oh, it, it was just very emotional to have her come so close. Mm. And she lifted her head, uh, she stood and looked at me and oh, that beautiful moment that everything came together so beautifully. The lighting, her mane flowing in the wind. Mm. And just this feeling of freedom, um, it, it was immense. And I just produced that, that single image of her. And I think it will stay with me forever. Um, and then the following day, I actually uh, won a, a major competition at the end of last year with a second image that actually involved her um, that I've got to show as well. Uh, it's actually called The Encounter, and it was given the name The Encounter. Um, again, it involved this beautiful little Palomino um, filly with the stallion of the group. And again, quite a distance from me, I can only assume probably a, a sire, um, no proof of that, but they just came together in this most beautiful moment and heads went down just bowed together with this mountain behind them <laughs> it took my breath away it was 
just such a magical experience and i think looking at that image you can feel the emotion come through it um it was a beautiful encounter i'm hoping to go back to try and find her again this year um just just to see her because she really has had such a, i'm i was really shocked that the power that came through her um her message that came across to me was absolutely immense and I think anybody that looks at her photograph can see that there's such a gentle power there mm. there's such a, a sweet little girl to have to command mm. so much attention and to command so much the way she did mm. um she will stay with me forever so yeah they're the two images that the first two um wild mm. spirit and the encounter beautiful thank you so much for sharing those it's a pleasure. Um, how did you go from photography being a hobby to being your full-time profession? Mm, good question. <laughs> I think having that work um, of being working in uh, a caring environment um, with rescued animals triggered that spark. As I said, I, I was noticing the messages coming back through the lens and thought there is more to this. The, the, I'm being given an opportunity here. For some reason, I've been chosen to do this and I know that this is where I need to be. I need to be putting those messages out there. And if these animals can communicate with me through my imagery, I need to expand this. I need to do this more. There are so many want to get their messages out. I need to be out there full time doing this. So it was a case of, yeah, okay, this is it. And it was a big decision to make, um, particularly when you have little ones. Yeah. Um, it's quite a, uh, a big decision to take when you've suddenly gone from having a regular job, mm. suddenly saying, this is it, I know what I need to do. That's a big decision to take, but it was a decision that was important to me personally. Um, that I needed to be that messenger and the only way I was going to do that was to take my photography into a full-time career. Mm. Each animal that I photographed I was suddenly aware mm. of what was happening um, and my first reaction was to like whoa step back from this because it was quite a shock mm. um, that I had that level of communication there um, and what was coming back through those images, I was coming back to uh, my desk and putting them on the screen and thinking, oh, wow, that's so powerful. And it was almost, you were sort of taking a breath because it was coming through so strongly. And I thought, well, no, this isn't something to be afraid of. Um, and if I have a job to do, um, if you want to call it a job, if I have a mission mm. or I've been given a task, by nature, this is your task. This is what you have to do. Many, many, many years down the line, yeah, it did work. Um, it actually did work, and it was what I was destined to do. Mm. So I'm glad that I followed that path. Mm. Um, I was guided by nature, and yeah, that's where I've ended up. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. So then, tell us about how did you? I mean, you had the dream about a very pale lion when you were a kid. So how did you get, how did you come to actually meet? Oh, my meet goodness. <laughs> okay, I was introduced in 2003 to two incredibly special white lion cubs. And I was absolutely oh, mesmerized by them, almost hypnotized by them. I'd heard of white lions, but obviously to me, they were more of a myth uh, than anything. And it suddenly triggered something in me that I wanted to learn a little bit more about them. Were they freaks of nature? Were they natural, natural occurrence? Where did they originate from? It was something that triggered and I thought it went back to the dream instantly. Mm. Oh my goodness, this is what I recognize. And it was very difficult because I thought, well, what do I do? I didn't know where to start. And I started doing my research and I couldn't find anything. There was nothing at all. Mm. 
And then somebody, um, a very good friend of mine said to me, oh my goodness, there is this amazing book. You need to read this book. And I bought a copy. Uh, it was called Mystery of the, of the White Lions, Children of the Sun God by Linda Tucker. I can honestly say I got two pages into that book and that was it. I, this is it. This is what I've been called to do. I couldn't explain what went on, but those first two pages, this is it. This is your calling. And I decided to contact Linda. Um, never expected in a million years to hear back from her. And um, wow, literally, she, you have a we need to talk. And I decided to launch in the UK um, a special uh, awareness raising campaign called Ghost of Africa. And I launched that in 2004 to help raise awareness of the plight of the white lion after Linda had given me a lot of um, amazing information into their origin. I was absolutely amazed by it. And I knew it was right. It, that dream suddenly ignited again. And I thought, this was your calling. It's been sitting there for so long. And now you found that path. That's where it needs to go. And I launched a campaign in 2004. And the following year, Linda personally invited me out to the project in South Africa, in the Timbavati. And, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I spent uh, a week at the project speaking with Linda and having an incredibly rare opportunity to actually see these most sacred cats, these incredible beings uh, within their own natural distribution range. It had such an effect on me. I, I yeah, such a deep effect. Mm. Uh, I left and, and came back and I decided on that flight on the way home, I had a long time to ponder on what I'd experienced with Linda and I decided that was it. I was going to dedicate the rest of my career um, to assisting in whatever way I could, uh, be this through imagery, um, be this through raising awareness, um, or whatever capacity I could. My career is now completely dedicated into yes. assisting in any way I can to an absolutely beautiful, beautiful animal. Um, they, they truly are. Uh, in August 2008, um, the Global White Lion Protection Trust um, awarded me the prestigious White Lion Raw Award, Recognition of Animal Rights, and that was for my ethical and sensitive approach to photographing large predators, both in the air situation and their natural environment. So quite an honour for me. Mm. And Linda then again gifted me the most amazing opportunity uh, to take the first ever signature images of those wild lions, um, which was an experience I never ever thought I would get to do. Mm. But I had the privilege of um, producing those first initial portraits of the first generation of wild born white lions. Uh, born upon the soil of their ancestors. So I recorded those first little poor steps um, across the heartlands, which, yeah, has led me on the path that I am now. Mm. <laughs> so my big thanks not only go to Linda, um, but to oh, those beautiful members of that pride who have been my teachers, to be honest. They've taught me so much, um, a skill that I knew I had to develop um, after having those uh, communication um, images in a care situation, the prides at Zal have taken me on the journey even further. And their messages will be coming stronger and stronger with each visit. And even now to this day, um, many years down the line, 15 years later, 16 years later almost, every encounter I have with them, they have a new story that they wish to to put out there they have a new message for humanity um 
and people just need to sit and, and look at those images and connect with them to, to understand the power um, that comes through those images uh, and the harmony uh, that comes through there. And again, as we said, that high level of respect. And the, the images are transformative. Looking into the eyes of a white lion, it is an, a magnificent transformative experience, as I have experienced. My <laughs> you have. <laughs> um, but as we said earlier, it shows the power of silence. Mm. And they say every picture tells a story. Mm. Um, and this is it. So when somebody picks up a camera for the first time, I, I get it said to me so often when I when people see me working, oh my word, lens envy, oh, I wish I had that sort of equipment. Mm. You can take an award-winning winning image on a mobile phone. <laughs> yeah. a, a typewriter never wrote a great novel. It mm. comes down to you as a photographer or as a messenger, mm. just open up to, to nature and, and what you're trying to photograph. Mm. Let them speak to you. Just hold your lens then, let them speak. You'll know instinctively when to press that shutter once that conversation is in full flow between you and them. Mm. And I don't mean, so. I mean, we all chat to our pets. Mm. So why can we not chat to wildlife? Why can we not chat to a giraffe? Mm. Why can we not have a chat with an impala? Mm. We chat to our pets. They may not be able to converse with us directly, but we know if our cat's content, it's going to curl up on our lap. Mm. We have respect for them. So they are part of, of the same thing. So we need to expand that into nature as well mm. um and to say looking at those images let them let them speak to you let, let them oh you need to open up to them you really do yeah and i mean you know in my work as an animal communicator i know that um you know all animals are individual even you know, litter, litter brothers. I had two litter brothers when I was well, sort of 20 years ago. They couldn't have been more different. They all, they all have their own story, their, their own personality, their, their own feelings. They're as different as what people are. And, you know, as you, as you said, listening to them, taking the time to sit with them, just to be quiet with them, let them tell their story. You don't have to be an animal communicator. You don't have to hear or, you know, receive uh, images or their voice, but you know, it's like your intuition can pick up what, what it is they want, as you said, what it is they want or their personality or, yeah, if they need something or, and, and sometimes just, just the dance that happens between a person and an animal, whether they be your, you know, part of your family or whether they be a white lion. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it's so, it's so beautiful. Yeah. I think again, it's something that I learned through my time of working in a care facility. We have, I used to get a lot of people come in and say to me, oh, do you, do you go in and hug the tigers or the lions? Mm. Mm. No, I actually do enjoy living. Um, <laughs> firstly, that would be disrespectful. Oh, yeah. We seem to have an obsession. Um, it's something weird where I'm conscious of myself, but mm. we have a habit of putting our human emotions onto animals. Mm -hmm. And... We seem to think the only way we can project love to an animal is to hug it. Mm. Now, for many species, if you put your arms around it and enclose it, mm -mm. you are suddenly trapping it. And yeah. it's going to fight to release itself because it doesn't understand what this means. Mm -mm. So when you find your cat pouring on your lap with his feet, they have little scent glands between their pads. So, yeah, this, I'm going to do a little bit of scent marking here. I'm just going to scent mark your lap. The second cat, 
the second cat's not going to get on there because the first one's already sent an aunt in. <laughs> but it's this obsession that you have to put your arms around something to show love and you don't have to. It can be portrayed in many ways. And I actually, my experience of, of hugging is, it's almost, it's going to sound a bit strange, but it almost um, releases the feeling of love. Whereas if you sit with an animal together, it builds the feeling of love somehow. And, and Maya's been teaching me this because this is my office and it's also her room. And she sits in front of me and, and I used to put my arms around her, you know, and I was very conscious that I wasn't, you know, squeezing her or anything, but I noticed, I've noticed that um, she will move, she will go to move away unless I am really conscious and just kind of holding her on the outside. And she, and just the way that she is with me, I've learned that I was putting a little pressure on her. I was pulling her towards me, even just slightly, but enough. And she's shown me that you know that I was doing that and and now I I feel like I'm giving her her space and respecting respecting her space while still have any and it is we have a stronger connection when she's sitting in front of me because I'm not trying to wrap my arms yeah, around her exactly yeah. love doesn't have to be physically putting your arms around an animal and hugging it it's no. alien to them yeah so, yeah. no, I would never do that to any of my animals as much as I dearly love them. They <laughs> yeah. know that, they understand that. They will, as you say, come and sit close by, mm. sit on my lap. Um, <laughs> I've got my cat, or he's fast asleep by my side here. But mm. quite often when I'm talking to somebody or if I'm doing an online tuition session or something, quite often he'll come and wander past as I'm talking. It, it's... I'm here, yeah. I need to be listened to, yeah. um, but I would never put my arms around him and hug him because it's something he doesn't understand. So through photography, and as I said, with the white lines in particular, mm. when I'm getting that eye contact through the lens and we're looking at each other, oh, wow, that is so powerful. Mm. Um, and it can be seen through the images. They tell me when they're ready you instinctively know when to press the shutter mm. to bring that emotion through, to bring their message through. Mm. Um, and as we said, I mean, people say you can smile with your eyes. And I know we've all come to learn that over the past 18 months wearing face masks. <laughs> you don't have to physically see somebody smile. You can see it within their eyes. Mm. So eye contact through the photography with an animal they can communicate with you. You do understand. And it is quite an emotional experience. Um, I've had grown men sitting in a game vehicle reduced to tears. I mean, that's how powerful it is. Once people open up to that and accept it and embrace it, mm. it's actually such a powerful feeling. Very, very powerful. Um, powerful, but in a gentle way. So you had a couple of uh, photos to show us of the white lions. I do. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the, the first one um, that I have here is called Ghost of Africa. Mm. And again, I've, I've said before previously of that eye contact, how much power is directed through a particular eye contact. This image, there is no eye contact, but you can see and feel the power coming through the image. There's, again, that word gentle, mm. the power of silence coming through. Um, and it's quite a reflective look um, at a white lion. We can see how truly stunning and beautiful they are. And to me, photo photographs of them still don't do them justice. I think mm. they are breathtaking. Mm. When you look at them with the naked eye, um, when you're actually seeing them as they are. Um, but sadly, they have been exploited, as we know. It is a heartbreak 
Um, so it is is one of those things that I think, as I said, why I've dedicated my career in trying to assist uh, the Global White Lion Protection Trust and, and Linda as, as much as I can and spreading that awareness. Uh, and I've always been amazed at how many people have never actually heard of white lions. Mm. Um, but as we said, it is that fine line between commercialism and conservation. Mm. Um, we can see how truly beautiful they are, but the power through this image, it really is. It's one of those, it's what I launched the project on, um, the awareness campaign uh, goes to Africa, but those eyes tell the story. Mm. Um, I think people just need to sit and, and look at that and really open their hearts to it. Because mm. it is absolutely amazing. Uh, the second one is called King. Um, wow. Again, no, no eye contact in here, but the power that comes through the imagery is just amazing. And it's, again, letting them speak that message. Um, open, really open your heart mm. and you'll be amazed. Mm. It's not an intimidating feeling. It's one of feeling power of, of your own, your own empowerment. Mm. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful image. Mm. Uh, again, just evoking that emotion and triggering, mm. hopefully, something in people that they will empathise with, they will connect with, mm. and, and hopefully follow that same route. Don't don't be scared to take that route. It, it's it's a beautiful destination. Mm. Uh, the journey is amazing, uh, and the destination is even more beautiful. And I, I'm I imagine with your guidance um it would also it also stands to reason that by being respectful being quiet sitting quietly whether it's with an animal or in an area where an animal can come up to you when you're in a state of love and respect they're actually more likely to show themselves or to give you that photo. So if you're authentically loving and, or, you know, authentically in a state of love and respect, you're going to be rewarded or more likely to be rewarded. Definitely. Um, and as I said, it's how you hold yourself. Mm. If you're sitting in a vehicle and you're all excited, and let's face it, for some people, their first ever journey going out to, to somewhere like a safari and going on safari for the first time, it is exciting and it's natural instinct for us to get excited and, oh my goodness, look at this, oh, look at that, oh, look at this over there. If you are busy in your own aura, you're going to be giving that buzz of energy out and they, they will pick up on that instantly. They're instantly going to think, whoa, okay, this is a little bit, little bit too much for me. I'm going to step back. Don't pursue them. Mm. do not pursue them that's really one of the, the major golden rules don't pursue them let them come to you mm. if you sit calmly don't pick your camera up instantly either mm. uh, it's another thing that I, I try to encourage people don't instantly pick the camera up mm. hold your head in a way that they know that you are no threat to them mm. sit calmly sit quietly once they have relaxed continue to feed or they decide to relax next to the vehicle you're sitting in mm. very slowly and calmly ask mm. them if it's okay to take the image up the camera mm. hold the camera over wherever you're going to be doing that produce the image bring the camera back thank them mm. thank you goes a long way mm. um, so a calm relaxed atmosphere the respect level is there instantly mm. it it has to be it's something that has to be done so mm. be very as i said we have to be conscious of our own whatever we're doing if mm. we're jumping about and getting excited mm. it's going to overflow so if you are calm relaxed you have that air about you they will have to come and sit with you mm. they will let you produce that message Ask them if it's okay. Yeah. They turn their head away from you. They're not ready. Mm. And, the and back down. honor, honor their, what they say or what they show you. Yeah. 
Exactly. And then if they do decide to move away from you, yeah, it may be disappointing for you, but remember, they want that distance. Mm. They've said what they need to say. If you respect that, try again maybe a few days later, Mm. go back again. Would you like the opportunity to speak again through my lens? Mm. There we go. If you have another message, okay, if you'd like to do that again, Mm. I'm ready when you are. I will sit there and I will wait patiently. I won't be making noises or moving about on my seat and shuffling. We'll sit in peace and quiet until you're ready. When you're ready to produce that message, you tell me and I will lift the camera. Mm. Thank you very much. We're done. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. It goes a long, long way. Mm. That's just the way that I prefer to work. And you've seen some of my work. It, it does work it does oh work. yeah and it's it's so similar to the way we communicate with you know actually communicate with animals because we do the same thing we we'll ask them is it okay and we'll know we'll feel if it is okay or if for whatever ever reason it could be it's not okay and then we do the communication we we let them tell their story we we may ask them questions We wait for their response. We write it down exactly as they tell us. We don't interpret it. We write it exactly as they tell us. And then at the the very end, we thank them and we say goodbye. Mm. This is so similar because it is. It's like two different mediums with the same goal, and that is to share the story of the animal yeah the other thing that i would also try to encourage people for anybody wanting to um pick up a camera for the first time you don't have to travel to exotic locations mm. if you have a little area around you maybe a small backyard or a little quiet area where you can go to just sit and observe mm come back each day at the same time they will get used to you being there don't expect them to come to you instantly so birds will get used to being you being there you become something they don't feel threatened by Mm. let the birds for the first couple of days don't don't produce images don't do anything at all just let them get regular with that feed them in your garden that's fine what becomes an issue is people advance it they become very excited at the fact they can produce these images because birds are coming into a feeder every day and then suddenly it goes from being feeding to using props that is baiting and that is not ethical Mm. don't be tempted to put things there for them to stand on for the sake of photography that is not ethical Mm. If they're feeding naturally, that's absolutely fine. Particularly garden birds, that's absolutely fine. Have a feeder there. You have an opportunity to photograph behavior because they're naturally feeding. But don't start using props. Don't start taking things out for them to stand on because that's when it goes from being ethical Mm. to commercial. Mm. And this is not, I've seen it done so many times. it, it's not on mm. so always be aware of what you're doing I mean last year during lockdown obviously I couldn't travel and it's something people can do quite easily at home I have a bird feeder and I noticed over the space of a week I lovingly refer to them as the crash mm. uh, we had a group of starling youngsters mm. And there must have been 20 or 30 of them. And I put two bird feeders in my garden. And every day at the same time, the creche would descend on the garden, frantically feed, squabbling away over all the food, and then disappearing again. Mm. I thought, okay, well, this is really interesting. So I started sitting out there with them. Mm. Quite a distance at first, I was sitting maybe 30, 40 feet away from them. Mm-hmm. Then I started moving my chair just a little bit closer each day, the camera in the same position each day. They became familiar with me being there. 
to the point where I was sitting no more than 10 feet from the feeder mm. with them squabbling over food. <laughs> they weren't interested in me being there because I posed no threat to them. I became familiar to their surroundings quietly sitting there with my camera I didn't move I just pressed the shutter and I produced some amazing people can do this it's a great way of connecting mm. even in your own garden mm. there's so many things out there that want to bring their messages across mm. even a local park you'd be amazed even down to the minor, minor little things, the little spiders and the snails in your garden. Mm. They've all got a message to give. They all have an important role. So they're just as important mm. as an elephant. So we get these huge big animals, but even the tiny little ones, they're, they're just as important. Just And it's good practice as well. It is it's wonderful good. practice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, particularly as, as birds are flight animals. Um, as we know, uh, we have that little target, the comfort fight and flight, or comfort flight fight. Um, most animals, if you are within the comfort zone, are fine with you there. Mm. We then come to the flight zone, you move a little bit too close, uh, you're a little bit too comfortable with them, and they're going to take flight, cross into the bullseye, you're going to get the fight zone, that's not an area you want to be in. Mm. Um, and something I would never encourage anyone to do, don't cross those boundaries. There are boundaries to keep. Mm. Uh, and if you want to keep that respect level, definitely do not cross over into that that uh, that zone where you shouldn't be. Um, you want to see natural behaviour, you want to see those messages coming through. Mm. And I think for, you know, I recognise those urges in myself, um, you know, wanting to be closer to, to nature. I, I remember one time, well, I think it was in 2012 when I went to um, South of the Leadership Academy and we were travelling to, um, to Aconhook. And on the way, you know, the road from South to... Uh, Aikon Hook and on the way for the first time in my life I saw elephants and you know we'd just been through we hadn't we hadn't come to the end but we've been through this amazing experience where I felt closer to my soul than I ever had in my life and suddenly I saw elephants and I just squealed you know elephants out you know and completely came out of it but I think you know, it's it's like not to beat yourself up about it, but to really be honest with yourself and, and what it is, where it comes from. Why do you feel that you need to to take advantage of nature or whatever it is um, and and just be, I don't know, kind of be strong, strict with yourself almost. For, you know, and, and to, to, because we know all of us, you know, especially in the kind of work that, that you're doing, that I'm doing, and, you know, probably anyone who watches this, what we really want is the best for nature and the best for wildlife. And we are the problem. And that's not just those people out there. You know, we all have stuff we can work on to be, to be more honourable and to be more respectful of nature. And we just have to be honest with ourselves. And Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the things that I'm, I'm exploring, obviously, like everybody, I've had 18 months to sit and think about what is happening and, and seeing how people are changing, um, how their, their, their attitudes are changing and people wanting to um, connect with nature. And... One of the things I think that is very important is that we look at children um, because it's it's very difficult to change the mindset of an adult, mm. but it's very easy to steer the mindset of a young child. Mm. And if we can encourage children to pick up a camera, and the only reason I say this is because if you give child a child praise for what it does, that child feels valuable mm. 
and it feels it's a, it has an important role to make. And let's face it, as a child, when you're praised for something, you feel amazing. Ah, oh, I did something really good. So if we can send children out with a camera and they photograph something and they come back, that may be the last opportunity we'll ever get to see that particular animal or that species. If that child is so proud of that image, it's going to want to keep doing that. Mm. It will protect what, it's, what that child has photographed. Mm. It's a great way of getting people to want to go back. Don't destroy it, protect it, mm. because then you're going to get the constant praise. Oh, my goodness. Yes, look at that. You want to add that level of protection. And I think it's the way to go is mm -hmm. to encourage children to pick up a camera and be proud of what they've produced. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a couple of years ago, I had a, an amazing opportunity to work with young people with anxiety disorders. Okay. And we found it a great way of trying to use a form of self-expression by using a camera. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how it helped them to overcome some of the difficulties that they were facing. Mm -hmm. So photography is such a powerful medium, mm -hmm. but I think if we can encourage the next generation to pick that camera up and want to keep going back, they have that need to keep going back. They are not going to let anything harm what is there. So it's a great way of, of, encouraging protection mm. um, and people when you look through a camera things look so different mm. even rust rust is a living organism mm. it's beautiful it really is everything looks beautiful it does look beautiful through a camera mm. um, so i would encourage anyone to to pick up your camera get rid of all the stresses of life mm. even if you take it up as, as a hobby something you do now and again but just look at that photograph that you've produced. Know that you have done something good. You've brought across a message for an animal. You might even not even know you've done that. Mm. But have a look at it. Mm. Let, see if they have actually used you mm. to speak. Mm. Mm. So I would, yeah, I would encourage anyone uh, to have a go mm. to, to pick their camera up. And wow, it's an amazing feeling. <laughs> Oh, I, I want to just grab my camera and just... Blow it there out. we go. <laughs> uh, so, so tell us, like, how, what do you teach people? How can people learn from you? You know, what, what are you doing? Okay, well, I do host, uh, now Travellers Opening Up Again, um, I do host a number of uh, workshops throughout the year. Uh, tours where people can come and join me. They're normally very small groups. Mm -hmm. uh, I normally take a maximum of about six people. This way they have my entire attention the whole time. And it's to teach those principles, mm -hmm. how to apply them. Um, they're very ethical. We uh, basically, the guests are shown how to produce those images when to step back, when to put the camera down, mm. and a great way of them being able to engage with nature. Mm. Um, and it, as I say, has had an incredible effect on many people uh, that have come out before, but um, hosting a new series this year in Kenya uh, mm. on the Maasai Mara during the Great Migration. Mm. Now, it is something that I know many people are fascinated with, and it's our way of being able to sit back and watch how this unfolds, how these animals communicate with each other, and the message they're trying to get across to us, please stand back, this is what we do. Mm. Observe how we do this and observe how, how we work. Um, so that one is going ahead this year. Hopefully now things are lifting. Mm. Um, so there are uh, many opportunities uh, throughout the year uh, where people can join me on some of these trips. Uh, the information is on my website. Uh, people can go on there and see what tours I have uh, available. And an opportunity to, as I say, spend some real quality time with nature, getting to understand and to listen to those messages, mm -hmm. learning how to interpret them, and 
or finding their own way of, of letting the world know these animals want this message out there and your opportunity to become a messenger mm. uh, and a guardian. Mm. Uh, yeah. Just, being a guardian, I, I mean, I don't see myself as a conservationist. I'm a guardian. That's, mm. that's what I'm here for. Mm. Uh, and a messenger. Mm. Um, I, I have a role to play and that is my role. Uh, I had a lovely conversation with a very sweet lady a few months ago who said to me, I wish I could do more for nature. Um, but as we all know now with the cost of living crisis, it's very difficult for people to do that. It's not all about monetary um, donation. A lot of the time it's your voice, add your voice, mm. pick up your camera and let nature speak through you. Mm. It's something anybody can do. Mm. You just have to open up mm. um, and your contribution to nature just on that alone will have a huge significant difference. Mm. If enough small voices can speak together long enough and loud enough together, we're going to be heard. Mm. Um, let's keep it going in the right direction. Mm. Oh, thank and you. I'd love to welcome anybody who would like to join. Um, yeah, the world is opening up again. Yeah. <laughs> thank goodness. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a dream since I heard about your tours. It's been a dream of mine to join you and... I hope one day that will come true. You'll be very, very welcome. All my warm welcome will always await you. <laughs> and I will put your website address on the description of the video. So people thank you. There are a number of uh, things on the website as well. There is a blog where people can actually have a read of mm. um, conservation ethics. Um, uh, but uh, an article on there, rewarding nature. Um, that will explain just how important our role is mm. um, and working together, um, mm. how, how we, we can do our part. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today and sharing those stunning photographs. And yeah, good luck. I hope that you take this and just you know, share it with so many people and so many people are moved by your work and take up their mantle and <laughs> their thing. And, yeah. it's, it's in us all. Uh, we all have that capability. We really do. And I would embrace anybody to just say, look, just, just go and do it. Yeah. Um, you'd be surprised at how it will, how you'll grow as a person. Mm. Um, and yeah, if you want to be an influencer, let's influence it in the right way <laughs> beautiful and i think that's a beautiful note to end off <laughs> thank you very much thank you i hope this conversation has inspired you to pick up a camera or investigate your own creativity as always these conversations are in support of the global white lion protection trust and in collaboration with animal talk africa the links to both of their websites are in the description of this video as is kj's website if you'd like to support my work i have put the links of patreon and buy me a coffee also in the description of this video I will be grateful for any contributions to this work and 50% of any donations will go to the White Lion Trust. Thank you.